uh, talking about imprints that you've made, um, um, I have uh, been privileged enough to uh, be involved with and build 432 uh, Park Avenue. That's the 1,400 foot building on 57th Street, Park Avenue, the block front, 56th, 57th. Um, and um, we, we have made an imprint. We have changed uh, the skyline of New York. And people come up to me frequently because I've been in the business for so many years and they say, we love your building. That's always wonderful to hear. Uh, and you've really changed the skyline and that's terrific to hear. Um, I wish my parents were around so they could hear that. And um, they say, well, how do you feel about that? And uh, I'd like to start my comments by telling you, um, I really feel terrific that I've made a contribution, that Raphael Vignoli has designed a extraordinary building, that it has uh, really defined uh, the skyline, especially the east side. And, um, a, a couple of um, a couple of weeks ago, I was playing golf uh, in a tournament. I was invited to Trump Ferry Point. I don't know if anybody has been to Trump Ferry Point. It's really at the foot of the uh, of the bridge connecting Long Island to New York, and um, there I could see 432. Park Avenue, I thought it just, it just looked terrific, and I thought, my God, it really has changed the skyline, and I'm enormously proud of that. Um, uh, another building that we built, uh, exactly on the opposite hand, uh, is the Apple Cube in the General Motors building, and that uh, is, I think, a terrific achievement as well. Um, it changed the skyline. Usually a building will change the skyline a thousand feet. Used to be 60 stories or so, now it's a thousand, 1500 feet. But the Apple Cube, which is only 32 feet, really changed uh, Manhattan as well, and it changed the retailing on Fifth Avenue, and it brought a tremendous amount of traffic above 57th Street, which had not been there before. And I think it has performed a service and uh, actually become emblematic of the Apple company, which uh, didn't require much help, but certainly this has been a landmark for New York City. The sales that have been generated from the 25,000 feet is enormous, and I am extremely proud of that. Um, I started uh, I started my career as a, as a real estate broker, but was really interested in design and in architecture. Um, I always thought, I, I guess perhaps in retrospect, that uh, I'd be able to do things with architecture and, and design that were not being done in, in my industry. And when I started, there were certain restrictions. Uh, we didn't have cranes that would allow us to build 40 and 50 story buildings. Uh, we didn't have the technology and the steel which would allow us to go to high ceilings. So the first apartment house that I built uh, in 1978 had an eight foot three ceiling. I had departed from the industry seven, nine to eight feet and I kind of squeezed out another three inches and because I'd been building office buildings and, and uh, really understood the vocabulary of office buildings, I made all my doors floor to ceiling so that the ceilings even appeared higher and I tried to keep everything at one level so that there was this artificial visual datum. And from that time in 1978, those uh, uh, ideas that I had, I think I've really kind of followed through and worked with many architects. One of the questions that I was asked um, to consider talking about was, how many architects did you work with? What was the process that you went through in selecting your architectural team? 
and uh, it's it's very interesting. I I worked with uh, three architects. This is this is a bottle of grappa <laughs> that was given to me by Renzo Piano. I've been working uh, with with Renzo uh, for quite a period of time. We're friendly. We are fellow sailors. Uh, we've we've done a, a lot of business together. And Renzo was talking to me about his vision of what uh, the building would look like if I was successful in uh, assembling all the pieces on 57th Street. And uh, he gave me this bottle of grappa, which I treasure, have not drunk. And I, I like the little birds on, on top. Um, G Gary Handel from Handel was the master planner for uh, kind of the site, putting everything together, and Raphael Vignoli became the design architect. Uh, we were talking about uh, design inspiration, and Joseph Hoffman, especially uh, this wastebasket, became one of the design inspirations for the building, and you can kind of see that a little bit, and I have a presentation in my office where we show the coffers of the Pantheon, and you see the kind of push-pull of Joseph Hoffman and actually of the artist, artistry of Hans Hoffman. So there's a lot of going back and, back and forth. Um, the um, architecture of the building, I think, has been uh, admired, and I find that to be very flattering. Um, this is the cube on Park Avenue. Uh, we use this as a device uh, to put and hide a lot of the mechanical equipment for the lower half of the building. Uh, this is our retail building on 57th Street, which is nearing completion. And this is a photograph of the plaza from Park Avenue uh, as you approach the entry to the building. And this is the Port Cochere. You drive into the building on 56th Street, you drive out. And um, since our apartments are very expensive, we've put a may back in there, that's kind of uh, suggestive. Uh, so anybody who is interested in parking their may back and buying an apartment, please see me afterwards. Uh, uh, this, this is a picture of our lobby. We have idealized uh, Brand Cousy's Bird in Flight. Uh, that goes with the may back. And uh, these are the amenities of the building. These are of the restaurant, the swimming pool in a 30-foot space, um, uh, uh, the views from the buildings, from the, from the windows, the kitchen. I think also what we in the development community really do is with a great imagination, we try to uh, realize a dream. I think that's what uh, Mr. Durst is telling you that his family has been doing for years. And any responsible developer is really trying to bring a product that is both a dream, his fantasy, and with the research, the reality of what it is that he's creating. Because when you really think about it, we create the buildings, we build the buildings, condominiums, we sell them. Rental buildings, we hold them for long term, and our office buildings are part of the skyline of the city that we're, that we're involved with. But what in reality is the individual and that contribution? And I would imagine that the majority of this audience is from the development community. And I think that when I say it, you'll understand it. All we are is dreamers and we're custodians only for a short period of time. And then what we do, and if we've done it, and if we've done it well with our architects, with all the members of our team, if we have challenged our team and really produced something that's outstanding, then we're terrific custodians, but only for that period of time that we're here. And we have left our mark, is that me? And we've left our mark on the community. Those buildings that I've built and been involved with and been fortunate enough to be involved in the design, I'm enormously proud of. 
I think that my uh, contribution is as a team member with the architects, with our engineers, uh, is something that I treasure and I value. And I think the result is something that I'm proud of and uh, most, of, most of my colleagues are. Architecture is really very, uh, it's a very difficult, it's a very uh, competitive business. Really, you're exercising and demonstrating your taste, your philosophy, and your intellect. And hopefully, uh, you're right. I think Frank Lloyd Wright said, well, you can always build vines. But that's, that's not the case, not in our urban environment. That's not the case in Asia. That's not the case with the tall buildings that we're all here to see. And I'm enormously impressed by what our industry is doing, what my colleagues are doing, and I'm privileged to be part of that community. Bear in mind that there are certain things that have happened over the past 25 years, and I've been doing this for more than 50, that have changed dramatically the ability to be able to produce a building. As I said, the first building I produced had an eight-foot ceiling. 432 Park Avenue has a 16-foot ceiling. It's very interesting in 40 years that the ceiling height has doubled, it's dropped down a little bit so that you can run your mechanicals and, and uh, your energy saving devices above the hung ceiling using the office building philosophy. But it's really interesting to see how the engineering has so advanced that allows us to build buildings of 1,000 and 2,000 feet. The tower uh, under construction in Riyadh is going to be 3,000 feet. I'm enormously proud of 432 Madison Avenue. It's 1,396 feet. 1,396 feet is exactly a quarter of a mile. So here in Manhattan, I built a building that's a quarter of a mile high. I'm only the 14th tallest building in the world. And my colleagues on 57th Street with their antennas and a couple of more floors are going to outstrip me. In 1986, I built a building called Metropolitan Tower. It was the first four-sided silicone building in the city. The building was 78 floors. Uh, the lower part was a quarter of a million foot office building. Then there were 224 condominiums on top of it. It was a very modern uh, design, and it was the first time that uh, a glass system was used and it was glued together with GE silicone. That building was 716 feet. And I was considerably younger in 1986. I was then 21. Today I'm 30. You're laughing, thank you. And one more chuckle. And uh, 31. Thank you. Uh, and I went into Central Park. This is true. I went into Central Park and I took a picture of Metropolitan Tower and I was so proud of it because it stood there on the skyline. Uh, the architecture uh, took advantage, it kind of violated the grid a little bit, it torqued the building to, uh, more to our Central Park to give you more windows, more view. And I thought it was a very dynamic, very, very dynamic design. And my photograph shows the picture of Metropolitan Tower, and there is nothing there other than the Essex House. So things have dramatically changed. I was the seventh tallest concrete building in the world in 1986. And you can put that in, in your book. I know, you've, I know you're writing wonderful stories about tall buildings, but I was enormously proud of that. So here I had kind of made this transition. I was part of the building community, I had this wonderful landmark. That lasted for about 15 minutes. So, uh, so I think you can see that our community in development here and around the world is constantly looking, dreaming, and figure out ways to change it, to maximize. And the tall buildings, if you think about it, where they had been a controversy 20 or 25 years ago, with casting shadows, they're going to crowd the streets, there's not going to be 
enough room for people to live and walk. If you think about it, the tall building is perhaps the most efficient uh, use of space. You're allowed to take a small development site or development site and build up and not build out. You actually uh, create more uh, exciting views for, and that's what people want, that's what people pay for. And we're finding out that tall buildings of themselves, I'm sure the architects will verify it, are very, very expensive to build. You're shaking your head. They're enormously expensive to build. To both prosecute the construction, get the workers up, get the workers down, bring the material up, bring the material down. So buildings that we used to be able to build with cranes, 20 stories, 30 stories at, at the maximum because that was the reach of the crane, are no longer there. Now you have to pump concrete. You have to use exotic and uh, very interesting mixes which are highly chemical and they have to go up into pipes and, and, and get into the 1,000 and 1,500 foot realm. Piping elevators, ropes that swing back and forth, buildings that move, all of this is possible now because of the technological advances of both our engineers, mechanical, structural, we're very smart, our wind engineers, uh, the uh, concepts of what's happening in construction, a, a great deal of it comes from the aeronautical industry, a great deal of it comes from the maritime industry. So I think perhaps without Bernoulli, you couldn't be building the tall buildings that you are building uh, today. Um, anyhow, I think I, think I may be running out of time, I so yeah. I see a stop, yeah. but there is, just one story that I, I wanted to tell, oftentimes I do tell a joke, and I really uh, enjoyed my time at uh, Old Jews Telling Jokes. Uh, I don't qualify, in, but, uh, except religiously. But anyhow, there's the story told about the woman who's brought into the court. And the judge says, Sadie, what are you doing here? She said, well, I, uh, I was caught stealing something in the supermarket. The judge says, well, that's terrible. What did you steal? She holds up a can of peaches. And he said, well, how many peaches, peaches in the can? She said, six. He said, that's it, Sadie. Six nights in jail. Wait, terrible thing. From the back of the room, her husband stands up on a chair. He says, your honor. Yes. He says, I'm her husband. Yes, what do you have to say? She also stole a can of peas. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>